Uh, this is a training session uh, for Salam and Company solicitors. Uh, we have a brand name of Salam Immigration, so we would say that this is a Salam Immigration training session. Uh, this is being conducted in Manchester for the staff here, and uh, today is the 30th of October 2015. Uh, the today's uh, topic is naturalization, which is a part of the nationality topic. And now I am going to summarize, correct and elaborate and uh, <clears throat> make, make uh, say, this training session more useful. This is being recorded and uh, would be available to uh, others as well. Naturalization is uh, something which is for adults only, for those who are not adults or minors, uh, we have now I am going to summarize, correct and elaborate and uh, <clears throat> make uh, say this training session more useful. This is being recorded and uh, would be available to uh, others as well. Naturalization is uh, something which is for adults only, for those who are not adults or minors. Uh, we have registration as British citizens. So naturalization is for those who are over 18 and uh, they decide on their own as opposed to the minors. Uh, the requirements would include 18 years of age, mental capacity, full mental capacity. If you are not able to take your decisions on your own, you can't decide to make an application and become uh, a British national or because it involves a change of nationality or an additional nationality which is a big decision. So if someone is not of sound mind, he should not be able to apply for naturalization. Then there are residential requirements or residence requirements as we call them. Then there are uh, good character requirements. If someone is not of good character, he would not be naturalized, he would not be granted a British citizenship. Then someone who applies, these are uh, pretty recent things, should have a, a good English language proficiency and should also have some sort of knowledge about the culture and life in the UK. So life in the UK test is something you need to pass for English language, you need to pass a B1 English test. Uh, then there is a requirement of intention to stay in the UK at least by way of having a principal home or a principal residence in the UK in the future. It doesn't exactly mean that you would remain here, but you should uh, at least have that intention. And at the date of the application, you must demonstrate that you have a principal place of business in the UK where you intend to live for the rest of your life, say at least six months in a year. But these are only intentions. They don't... Uh, say create a problem for your nationality to continue once a nationality is granted it is very difficult and very rare that a nationality is sought to be cancelled there are situations but it's very rare and it's very difficult as well <clears throat> okay then the requirement is that you should not have been in breach of the immigration rules uh, we find the naturalization requirements in section 6 of the British Nationality Act 1981 and uh, these are elaborated more in chapter 18 of the nationality instructions issued by the Home Office. Uh, the act is uh, quite uh, uh, broad or general in a number of uh, aspects like uh, lot of things are left open like good character is left open it's not even defined in the act what is good character so this is left for the uh, government to form a policy so the home office has uh, produced a policy they keep on changing it like recently they've made changes so like good character is then explained in the chapter 18 as an extra d to the chapter chapter 18 of the nationality instructions then we have an extra B for residence requirements, 
it has been elaborated there some discretion is available there which is not <coughs> uh, there in the enactment so the home office has given their policy in an extra b for residence requirements then even for this future uh, plans or future requirements uh, like your intention to uh, remain in the uk is also detailed in an, an extra annex f this future uh, intention requirement is something uh, people do ignore and even the home office also uh, do not ask you any questions or make an issue out of it but it is a requirement uh, so we should keep this in view because things are getting tough the home office is uh, not that liberal or lenient anymore so while uh, making any application we should see that the person should have at least on the date of the application a residence here whether rented out or he owns it or rent it that's not a problem then these uh, requirements are also contained in simple words and simple terms in a guide called guide an which is available on the website in fact everything is available on the website so it's no rocket science it just requires a lot of reading and obviously understanding the general public sometimes would read things but would not understand it very correctly so since you are legal persons you are in a better position to do so read them and then advise the general public so there's a guide an then there's a booklet an booklet an is uh, just a simple uh, explanation of how to fill in the application form and the application form that we need to fill in is form an uh, there is a fee with this form with, which is 1005 pounds 1005 pounds which also includes 80 pounds for oath ceremony like if someone's application is refused he is not granted nationality because of any issues then the 80 pound for oath ceremony is refunded because there would be no oath ceremony the balance is the fee which is a processing fee there is no refund so if someone doesn't qualify but makes an application or he is asked to apply again because at the moment he doesn't qualify but he may qualify at a future date still the fee is not carried over it's gone it's processing at that stage so you have to make an application again now when there is an application this person may the applicant may be applying as a spouse of a british citizen or on his own if his wife is not british it doesn't matter whether he is applying uh, with the consent or uh, sponsorship of his wife or not but if he his wife or her husband whatever it is the spouse is a british citizen then there is a concession the concession is in residence requirements and in the indefinite leave to remain requirement the residence requirement for uh, people who are married to a british citizen is <clears throat> that during the last 12 months he should not have been away from the uk for more than 90 days and in the 3 years including this last 12 months in the last 3 years going back from the date of the application he has not been away from uk for more than 270 days now there is uh, since the requirement is only 3 years and there is uh, no requirement for waiting for 1 year after the indefinite leave to remain so they have an edge the moment you are married to a british citizen if you have already completed your 3 years you can immediately uh, file an application for nationality like if someone gets indefinite leave to remain uh, today he can he or she can file the application today if he's already done 3 years and is married to a british citizen another uh, important thing which uh, we need to understand is it's not that you were married to a british citizen for 3 years it is you are married to a british citizen on the date of the application like if you've married someone only yesterday and become eligible for the reduced uh, residential period of 3 years that's fine you can make an application next day or even the same day uh, there is some discretion as i said in the annex b they have uh, offered some uh, leeway for people who have more absences 
like the requirement is 270 days in three years but if it is 300 days they will disregard the 30 days excess absence number one number two if someone has more absences but he says look i've lived here for more than three years so then there is some more concession like if someone has lived here for four years he can have 450 days absences again a little more and if someone has been here for five years he can have 540 days absences so these are enhanced absences allowed on the basis of an enhanced residential period so if someone has resided more he will get a little more but if it is more than five years it doesn't matter that's that's the end now let's uh, discuss everything else as if the uh, applicant is not married to a British citizen. As I said, one of the residential requirements, the first one is that you should have indefinite leave to remain. Now we are talking about someone who is not married to a British citizen. So here there is a waiting time, which is 12 months. You cannot apply for citizenship successfully unless 12 months have elapsed from the date when you get the indefinite leave to remain. And then the requirement for absences or the residence as you may call it is that you've resided in the UK for five years counting backwards from the date of the application. And during those five years you have not been away from UK for more than 450 days. Then there is a discretion that if it is 480 days normally they should uh, ignore the 30 days excess absence and in addition if there is a, a longer residence and there are longer absences then there is a, a concession that if someone has lived here for seven years he can have up to 730 days absences likewise if someone has eight years of residence here he can have 900 days of absences during those eight years it's not for the five years it's for the eight years you have to take the whole eight years and match the and total the absences which should not be more than uh, 900 and again the same uh, 12 months uh, the last 12 months is important you should not be away for more than 90 days during the last 12 months so last 12 months means from the date of the application so this is mainly the residential requirement. Then we have the uh, good character requirement. Now good character is, as I said, quite a subjective term. Uh, there have been disputes, case law recently. A lot of applications are being refused on the basis of the good character requirement. And uh, very trivial things, very minor things are being uh, made an excuse for refusing British citizenship. And a number of applications are being refused. There are judicial reviews in the High Court against uh, such refusals because there is no right of appeal when an application for uh, a citizenship is refused. They ha have a reconsideration process. You pay 80 pounds and uh, you can apply for reconsideration. There is no time limit for making the uh, reconsideration request but uh, generally it is expected that you should apply within a reasonable time. Reasonable time would not be just 50 days, it can be 30 days, it can be 2 months or if you can explain why you have been uh, applying after a very long time, if there is a uh, reasonable explanation this may appear to be a reasonable period. So if there is an issue all you can do is make a reconsideration uh, application which is likely to fail in most of the cases because if they have applied whatever is their policy they will stick to, to their policy if you claim that no your policy is not correct it is not in accordance with the nationality act or blah 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 they have to follow their policy because it is the case worker or a senior case worker who is bound by the policy the, of the Home Office. If the policy is unreasonable or maybe even unlawful, unless the policy is changed, the case workers have to follow their policy. They can forward the case to some high-ups for 
consideration of uh, changing the policy and keeping the uh, reconsideration pending till then but this is rare so ultimately they do change their policy they do make changes we see changes every now and then uh, which are in light of whatever they face whatever is the type of applications they get and whatever experience they gain from processing the nationality applications now in good character uh, we can have uh, say civil matters and criminal matters if someone has a county court judgment against him uh, or some taxes outstanding against him uh, which which show that this person is not a straight person so then then we have a problem if someone has say a county court judgment in which it is uh, apparent that the debt has uh, uh, arisen out of some fraudulent or recklessness of the applicant then he may not be of a good character and he can be refused on those grounds uh, sim similarly if someone has been bankrupted that is a ground for refusing uh, now we come to the criminal things if someone has been uh, convicted then there is a waiting period you, you cannot uh, immediately apply like if there is say the minimum is a non custodial sentence like if someone is convicted but there is no imprisonment involved it's only say something like uh, a fine sometimes there is community service so in those cases the waiting period is 3 years but unfortunately the waiting period in other other convictions where there has been a, a custodial sentence or an imprisonment that is to say then it is uh, quite serious like if someone has been uh, sentenced to 4 4 years or more of imprisonment then he can never apply for nationality that is considered as never spent we have a separate enactment on rehabilitation of offenders that is uh, uh, an act from 1974 which keeps on uh, seeing amendments the rehabilitation period in that act is a bit different i will come to that later on first let us uh, see what the uh, waiting periods are and if someone has been uh, uh, sentenced to more than 12 months but less than 4 years then the waiting period is 15 years which is quite uh, substantial and if someone has an imprisonment of up to 12 months then he has to wait for 10 years so these are quite uh, draconian uh, there is another another thing to note that if someone has uh, a non custodial uh, sentence like fine or something as i earlier said the waiting period is 3 years but there is a concession which says that if you have only one such non custodial uh, uh, sentence like fine or uh, anything else and that has happened uh, more than a year ago more than a year ago not in the last 12 months so if it is more than a year ago then that can also be overlooked we do have a lot of issues with uh, motoring convictions because motoring is something quite common general public they are all driving if not every day quite uh, often so they do come across speed cameras they do come across police stopping them uh, if they are not driving properly sometimes it's over speeding sometimes it looks like the person is drunk while driving or is, if there is an accident uh maybe it is recklessness on the part of the driver who's now the applicant so they also create issues any any police fines like uh, when it's like a fixed penalty notice like when they catch you for speeding either the police or a speed camera they offer you a fixed uh, penalty and if you settle it by way of the fixed penalty and points there is a mechanism available then it is not a criminal conviction so then then it is like a civil penalty it's something settled uh, otherwise
so that doesn't count so uh, there is no waiting period if you have something like that but good character doesn't mean that if you are not convicted then you can never be refused say if you do such things every now and then like even if you have uh, a number of parking tickets you are habitually not paying parking fees you habitually parking wrongly say if someone has dozens of parking tickets in say the last 12 months or there is no fixed fee i'm just no fixed time i'm just uh, giving an example so he can still be refused as someone of not good character similarly if someone is caught for speeding again and again and uh, then it is settled by way of uh, uh, fixed penalty notice they can still refuse you if it looks like this person is a habitual offender he has no respect for the law uh, when something goes to the court like the magistrate court like sometimes you challenge the uh, speeding offense uh you say no i was not driving at this speed you go to the magistrate court mostly you will fail because the camera would be something as uh evidence which the court would not doubt if there is a police officer he would also have uh, a gadget through which he has recorded the uh, speeding so it's the police officer's evidence in the court he will come as a witness if he would say yes i have uh, uh, seen him driving fast and i have measured his speed this is the gadget or device which shows that he was driving more than the uh, limit then invariably the court would say yes this is sufficient evidence unless you cross examine the police officer and try to prove that he is a liar so which is quite difficult and plus why would a police officer lie he would not even know who you are so that's why the courts would take their word as truth so when the magistrate convicts you for anything if you get even a fine the same fine now becomes a criminal conviction and if it's a criminal conviction then you have to wait for 3 years and sometimes uh, there are some serious ones like drink driving or uh, uh, say reckless driving and you are convicted with even imprisonment at times so then you have a serious problem like uh, any any imprisonment would be something and telling a 10 years waiting period so we need to be very careful and we should uh, obey the law as much as we can mm. the english requirement as i said is uh, simply any english test that you have passed which is equivalent to b1 level of the european framework so we know what tests are there there is a, a guidance on it if if there is any confusion life in the uk test there is no confusion we know what is a life in the uk test it, if you pass that that's fine uh finally we come to the documentation documentation in uh, uh, nationality applications is something which is uh, quite uh, uh, simple you don't have to provide a number of documents like with the other immigration applications you have to provide a number of documents here you provide a very few documents like if someone is uh, claiming a short uh, residence period on the basis of being married to a british citizen obviously he should provide a, a marriage certificate to show that the that he is married to a british citizen similarly if someone is in business he has to provide uh, say uh, something from the home, from the hmrc uh, so as to enable the home office to check your tax records like a self assessment statement or something like that uh because they need to see if you are doing a business are you paying taxes with salaried people they don't have to provide anything from hmrc they only have to disclose their uh, national insurance number in the uh application form and uh, that is enough because the taxes are a liability of the employer 
the employer has to deduct the taxes and pay it. If he has not done so, uh, then the employer can be held liable and they can recover. So they don't make an issue out of any unpaid taxes on salaries. Uh, so that's why they don't want any documentation on that. So for the residential requirements, you have to provide passports uh, covering the residential period, say it's three years, five years, or whatever it is, say uh, seven or eight years. So the passports for all those years, whether it's one passport or more than one, they would normally show all the stamps of being in and out of uh, the UK. But we do have issues with people traveling within uh, Europe. Obviously, most of the people would travel to Europe just for holidays, so there won't be many. But if there is something more than that, then you need to provide alternate evidence because it's not apparent from the uh, passports that you have been in the UK, even if there is no uh, stamp there. Uh, the, uh, at the airport, they do uh, stamp and put an exit stamp on your passports but you do not always get uh, a stamp when you re-enter the UK. So we don't know when you, af after you've left, when you came back. So that can be an issue. And uh, we've done cases where in appeals we had to provide a lot of evidence like bank statements for all those years, employer's letter for all those years. We would say, yes, he has been on leave only on the following days and he has been attending the uh, office or business uh, throughout this period except for these absences sometimes something from the university or college where you you have been studying uh, things like that the bank statements what what i meant was they would also sometimes show that there are transactions going on you are issuing checks you are drawing money from the atms here in the uk so that is a, an evidence that you were in uk sometimes there would be ATM transactions, say, from Spain. That means you were in Spain on those days and suddenly after a few days there are ATM transactions in UK. So that shows that you were uh, back. So that can be uh, sometimes an issue. There are no requirements for any uh, educational qualifications. You don't have to provide anything like that. Uh, there is no issue with uh, benefits or tax credits. A lot of people would ask, this is a frequently asked question, if I am taking benefits, would that affect my nationality application? The answer is always no. Once you have your indefinite leave to remain, then that is something which is, which is not a consideration at all for a nationality application. So that's why very few documents are required wherever relevant like if there is uh, say a criminal conviction or a county court judgment the form would ask you for that so it's always advisable to not only give the details but also uh, attach copy of any conviction uh, order or sentencing order uh, just to elaborate exactly when was the date of conviction what was the date of sentence and things like that one thing with the sorry the convictions i would say uh, although the application uh, date is material when we say three years from the date of the application you should not have counting backwards any convictions but if at the date of the decision three years have uh, elapsed they will still grant you nationality uh, so that that is uh, a concession You don't have to, say, provide uh, a copy of any tenancy agreement or of your residence in the UK to show your future intentions. Uh, it's not required. There is a list given at the end of the form AN, which is quite useful for you to understand what documents are required. But it's uh, nothing extraordinary. With the breach of immigration conditions, sorry, the last thing uh, I could see uh, on whatever scribblings I've made for my memory uh, is something that is uh, required that your stay is parts of part of the residential requirement. So if you uh, meet the residence requirements but 
part of that is not law. It's five years or whatever period of uh, residence that we have discussed is all lawful residence. It's not unlawful. If someone has been here illegal and somehow he gets uh, in the end uh, indefinite leave to remain, he cannot apply after 12 months saying that I've lived in the UK for 20 years and it's been uh, more than a year that I've got my indefinite leave to remain. No, he would not get it unless he completes five years or three years, whatever it is, of lawful residence. So lawful residence uh, does not only mean that you had a visa all along, but you have been abiding with the conditions of that visa or that leave to remain. Like if a student uh, completes his uh, uh, requirements, but while a student, he was working more than what he was allowed to work or he was working when he was not allowed to work. So that becomes a breach of the immigration rules. Similarly, if someone is not eligible to draw benefits before he was, uh, say, uh, a settled person, before getting indefinite leave to remain, that can be an issue. They would say, oh, you have been breaching the immigration rules. Your uh, leave at that time did say that you are not allowed to have recourse to public funds, but you were having recourse to public funds uh, unlawfully. So you were in breach of the immigration conditions. So if the residential or re sorry residence requirement is five years, so you need to wait for five years if you do during those five years if you have uh, breached the immigration rules. If it's three years, then you have to wait for three years. All these three years you should not have breached unless you reach three clean years or three five five clean years, you cannot qualify for nationality. Uh, lastly, I would say that there is uh, a facility available for uh, people to go to the town hall, the councils, some of the selected council, they do provide a service where they do a preliminary check of your application and while doing that they will guide you. They charge you about 60 pounds for their service and uh, the good thing of that service is that they will uh, look at the original documents and uh, keep copies and return the original documents to you so that you don't later on uh, have to face loss of documents or sometimes you urgently need back your documents including your passport. Uh, so that is uh, a good thing. With passport, sorry, I wanted to add one thing. Uh, if your uh, passport, say if you are a Pakistani, Indian, Chinese, whatever origin you are, uh, if your passport has expired, that is not an issue for a nationality application because you are applying for uh, British nationality. The passport is there only to show your residential requirements uh, and that you meet the residence requirement and your identity. Your international identity is your passport. So before you are British, that is your identity. So if you don't have a valid passport or an you have an expired passport, it is not an issue. Uh, another thing which uh, I can uh, recall is important is some countries have issues with dual nationality like we have China and India, uh, and Sri Lanka, some other countries. They say that if you get any other country's nationality then you will have to either uh, give away the nationality of your own country or surrender the passport. Uh, they may give you uh, still an ID card of that country to travel to that country. So that doesn't affect your nationality application. You are still okay to apply and get the British nationality because the British government doesn't have any issue with dual nationality. You can have any number of nationalities. The British government doesn't care whether uh, your country of origin has any issues with that. This is between you and them. It is between you and China or India or whatever. Like in some countries like Germany, they never allowed it, but recently they started allowing uh, only by application. You have to apply it to them that I need to apply for British citizenship uh, or US citizenship or whatever. So I need your permission. You explain the circumstances. They may allow you. Lastly, uh, I would say that the period of... Uh, nationality application processing uh, 
keeps on uh, varying. Generally, it is about two months, but sometimes it has uh, gone up to six, seven, eight months. Uh, say last last year, the position was very bad, but now generally it's two to three months. You do get it, but some applications, if they are not very straightforward, if they are not uh, prepared very well, they, uh, they can take more time. So professionally prepared applications, they always stand a chance of being decided promptly because the case worker sees no issues, he's got answers to everything, everything looks quite clear. So he is encouraged to decide that application. They have to uh, give output as well. So they would decide those applications first which are uh, very straightforward, very well presented, professionally prepared. Then we have, uh, during this processing, we have the uh, passport interview as well. People uh, do approach us and say, I want to apply for a passport. Sometimes they are applying for a nationality, not a passport. So they think passport is the nationality. No. Once you have the nationality, then the next step is to acquire a passport, which is just uh, a formality. You just ask for a document to verify that you have a nationality. So when you are granted uh, citizenship, you have to go for an oath ceremony, which is just a formality. They give you a certificate of naturalization. And then you make an application for a passport. And then they call you for an interview. Because it's your first British passport, they now always call you for an interview. Previously, they would only ask a couple of questions to see you are the same person. There is no identity issues. But now they ask more than that. Sometimes it's a 30 minutes to 45 minutes interview. They ask you dozens of questions, but mainly they are from your previous application form or nationality application form, just to make sure that you are the same person because there have been identity frauds. So there are a lot of more ifs and buts which I have not covered in this uh, short uh, uh, training summary so we will deal with the specific issues in more detail like with criminality and other things there are a lot of things which have to be uh, big issues at times so they they can be discussed in separate sessions i hope this session has been useful and you've got useful information on dealing with naturalization cases thank you very much